So we're in Romans 2 once again. I've got more to cover than I can cover, maybe in an entire series, maybe in an entire book. So let's get right on it. We're in Romans 2, and here's the passage that Paul is writing to us about, Romans 2, 5. He says, but because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone. I just want to make sure we see this word. He will judge everyone. That's everyone. Raise your hand if you're an everyone. Okay, okay, good. All right, most of us know that we're an everyone. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. So yeah, he will judge everyone, everyone. Does that include me and you? Well, everyone is pretty much an all-encompassing word, is it not? And so I want to start off this morning by asking a, a question that you may have asked in your life in the past about Judgment Day. I don't know if you've asked this question or not, but I have. And here it is. It's the first blank on your page. On Judgment Day, why does God care all of a sudden? Why does God care all of a sudden what happens in my life? Because he sure doesn't seem to care now, right? I mean, I feel like on some days I'm doing everything I can to be good, to be right, to be holy, to be nice, to not nice people, uh, you know, to not, you know, hit a squirrel uh, as I'm driving, you know, to stop in Kusawadi and let the ducks cross the road, you know, and not run over them, right? I mean, I try to do all the right things, and yet I feel like God still tries to punish me for it. Do you have those days? You feel like you're doing everything right, but just God won't give you a break. Come on. You've been there before, right? And you feel like, you know, I... I'm just trying my hardest, God. I'm just doing the best I can, God. And yet the bills keep getting bigger and my income keeps getting smaller. You know, I can't, I'm just doing my best. I'm working my hardest. I'm trying to be as good. But he keeps being angry at me. Or she keeps walking out. Or my boss keeps being a real idiot. You know, whatever the case may be, it feels like sometimes... Does God even care here? Why does he care there all of a sudden if he doesn't seem to care here? And not only that, but look around. Watch the news for the first five minutes and see what everybody else is doing. Watch the news and see how many nights in a row people have been breaking stuff and stealing stuff and burning down cities in America and God's going to judge me? Why, why does God care about what I do and don't do all of a sudden on Judgment Day? Yet we're told that we're an everyone, that God will judge everyone. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 5, we're told this, that we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. I mean, Scripture is pretty clear that all of us will face some type of judgment. Am I right? Why does God even care? Why do my works, my deeds, watching what's going on in the world around me, why do my deeds matter all of a sudden? And I just want to kind of submit to you today that our thinking along these lines tends to be very, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say it, very self-centered. Right, we tend to look at Judgment Day as if it's really all about me. And what I want to do a little bit this morning is I want to hopefully try to change your thinking about it, hopefully try to elevate the way you think about it, and hopefully let you see Judgment Day as part of a much bigger, much better picture. What if Judgment Day wasn't about God being a really angry and mean version of Santa Claus checking his list to see if you were naughty and nice. What if it's not really that? What if it's not really him giving you reward or punishing you based just simply on who you, what you've done? 
Sure, judgment day will happen. Sure, judgment day affects you. But what if it's not about you? What if it will happen to you and with you, but what if it's not about you? What if judgment day is about something bigger? What if, what if judgment day is in fact the reason you and I exist? What if judgment day is in fact the reason that this whole world was created? You see, here's what I believe is happening on judgment day. I think it's something much bigger than we usually give it credit for. I think that the reason God has set this all into motion, culminating in that big judgment day, is because he's doing something very intentional, doing something very meta, not micro, not me and you. He's doing something very meta. Here's what he's doing, and it's the next blank on your page. I believe that God is in the process of answering the greatest question ever asked. God is answering the greatest question ever asked. This question is a profound and provocative question. When this question was asked, it was so powerful and so provocative that war broke out as a result of this question. Do you want to know what the question is? Because this question ought to rock your world. This question ought to completely change the way that you think about the universe and about everything you say and do. It ought to change the way you think about the way you use your Saturday. It ought to change the way you think about the way you use your money. It ought to change the way you think about how you talk to your family. And what your habits and intentions are. It ought to change everything about us. So I had Rebecca, when she built the little handout sheet there for you, I had her leave a space in between the fill in the blanks so that you could write this question down. Here's the question that caused war to break out. Are you ready? Here it is It's Does God really deserve to be God? Write that down. Does God really deserve to be God you're like okay I don't really understand <laughs> let me break this down for you as best as I can you, you know kind of the story the accuser began his career as an accuser in the heavenly realm right you, you know the story he was one of the heavenly hosts his name, Lucifer, and he decides to lead a rebellion. He decides to lead a rebellion in heaven by asking this question, does God really deserve to be God? He legit thinks, I could be God. I, I, I could take over this whole thing. I could do better than he does. I could, be, I, I could handle it better than he can handle it. He's not what I am. I could be God. And somehow he convinces a third of the heavenly host to join him in this rebellion against a holy God. Am I right? And so this rebellion, this war breaks out in heaven over this question, does God deserve to be God? And of course, <laughs> the Lord is the Lord Almighty, and he can instantly deal with any rebellion, can't he? Does he need to have a big fight? Does he need to do a big, I mean, can, can't he just cease them to exist? But God does something really strange. God does something that you've probably wondered why he does this, but you've never really asked the question. God doesn't destroy the rebellious. He doesn't destroy Lucifer. He doesn't destroy those angels. For some reason, God instead chooses to cast them out. Not going to just end it, going to cast you out. And so he casts them out, and for some reason, for some reason, in casting them out, God chose, instead of destroying, God chose to answer that question. I don't know why, but he chose to answer that question. So here's what God did. 
And I know I'm talking kind of figurative language here, but Scripture tells us that at that point, God wrote a book. Right? He writes a book. Now, we don't know what all is in this book because you don't have this book. I know you're thinking, oh, it's the Bible. No, it's not the Bible. He writes this book that only he can write. What do you think? God's only got one book. I mean, he's God. He's only got one book credit to his name. So he's got this book that he writes. And this book that he puts together is unique because you've never seen it. I've never seen it. For some reason, God writes this book and then he closes the book and he seals it. So this book, to this day, written by God, remains closed and sealed. And he's put it away. I don't know if he's got a bookshelf. I don't know if he's got a little place under his throne. I don't know where he's put this book, but there's a book in heaven somewhere there with him. And then, after he wrote the book, closed it, sealed it, put it away, then God did something that nobody ever expected. God puts his book away, and then he utters these words. Let there be light. And God speaks all of the universe into existence. The galaxies, the stars, the planets, all of that he speaks it into existence. Every mountain that you see, every tree that is growing, every duck that won't get out of the road in Kusawati, right? Uh, every, every scrawny, hungry deer in Kusawati, every animal you ever see, every person you've ever met, God speaks us into existence. He created the heavens and the earth after writing his book. Why? And scripture gives us pretty clear clues in Psalm 19. The psalmist writes, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. He has spoken all the heavens into existence, and so they proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word, yet their voice is never heard. They, their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world, right? Psalm 150 says, let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Why did God create the universe? Why? Come on, somebody tell me, why did God create the universe? To what? Come on, David Lynn, to glorify himself. God himself says this through the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 43, he says, Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. That's why you and I exist. That's why this universe exists. This is our purpose to glorify God. That's why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to the what? Come on, the what? Do it to the glory of God. Don't do it for yourself. Don't try to build your own kingdom. Don't try to hoard or protect or guard or make yourself bigger, puff yourself up. No, no, no. Whatever you do, every hour you work, every mile you drive, every mouth you feed, everything you do, do all to the glory of God. God has created us to point to him, to declare his glory. He's created the universe and me and you to answer the question, to declare his worthiness of being God. And here's the crazy thing, okay? Here's the crazy thing. God is, one of his attributes is that he is omniscient. What does omniscient mean? What? All-knowing. He's omniscient. He knows everything. God knows all. That means that he creates this beautiful world, this incredible, amazing universe, knowing full well that the accuser that he had just cast out from heaven would continue to do what he started in heaven, that he would continue to accuse God of not being worthy of being God, and that he would try to lead a rebellion here 
just like he did in heaven. Do you think God didn't know that? Do you think God created all this and then, oops, it all fell apart. I blew it. Do you think that's what happened? No, God knew this would happen. He knew that Satan would try to destroy everything here by accusing God of not being worthy. Right? So he does, Lucifer, Satan, he does exactly what he started doing in heaven. He comes to the woman and he asks another question. Genesis 3, he says, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from the trees in the garden? Really? I mean, did he really say that? He goes on, he says, God knows your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you hear that question echoing? He's saying, does God really deserve to be God? He's holding out on you. He's God, and he's told you you can't have something. He's not really worth being God. You could be God. You could be God. You know better for yourself than God knows. You know what you deserve. You know what you should have. You should just take whatever you can because you could be God. You're worth it just as much as he is, maybe more so. He's asking the same question again. And what he's really saying is, let me show you. Let me show you why God doesn't deserve to be God. Because he can't make something that I can't break. Right? He can't make something. He's made all this, but I can break it with a couple of questions. I can break it with a couple of statements. Look what I can do. So God's made this beautiful universe all pointing to him. And then with a few questions, rebellion begins. We buy into the idea that we know better, that we deserve to be God. And we start fighting for ourselves rather than pointing to him. Am I right? And so all of creation falls. And if you don't believe me, all you got to do is look around at the brokenness, at the hurt, at the suffering, at the pain at the fires, at the racism, at the hatred, at the cheating, at the lying, at the anger, at the betrayal, at the pandemic, at poverty, and politics, and exploitation, and abuse. All you got to do is look around and that brokenness, that testament to it's all about me is everywhere around us. We participate, we, we participate in this rebellion ourselves, don't we? Every time we lie, every time we cheat, every time we act in an irresponsible way, every time we break relationships, hurt others, every time we neglect the kingdom of God and instead build the kingdom of me, aren't we, aren't we participating in this rebellion? And all the while, Satan gleefully claps, Yay! See, I can prove it. I can prove it. God doesn't deserve to be God. And Satan legit thinks that he's created a situation by breaking what God's made. He thinks he's created a situation where he's right. Right? I mean, think about it. Here we have a rebellious, sinful world, and what's God going to do about it? What's he going to do about it? Because if God chooses to condemn and destroy all of us, Satan says, then I win because I broke what he made. If he destroys all of us, then it shows that God has no mercy. God has no mercy and does not deserve to be God. But on the other hand, if God just condones it, turns a blind eye to it, just kind of lets it all happen, and we all live happily ever after in the end, then God has no justice. He's not really just. He's corrupt. He's weak. Either way, Satan thinks, I've got him, and he loses, and I win. Next blank on your page. Satan, the enemy, thinks he has proven his case. The enemy thinks he's proven his case. That's what's going on here. So flash forward. Time jump to that day. That day. Don't have time to go into the whole thing, but here's what happens on that day. On that day, 
God will gather everyone together and he pulls out his long sealed book now I don't know what all is in this book you don't know what all is in this book I know enough of what's in it to kind of get the gist of it God breaks the seal and opens the book and this book tells the story of how God will create a perfect universe that all points to him chapter one <laughs> chapter two is how the enemy will break it or at least seem to break it by causing a rebellion in this world so that it will no longer point to him that Satan would be successful in spiritually killing the human beings made in God's image, putting them under the judgment of God. So it starts off pretty heavy. But then this book reveals that God, in fact, had a plan all along. Right? That this book also shows that, believe it or not, God's plan all along uh, was that this would all happen and that God would choose to look at me and you. Instead of with condemnation, he would choose to look at us with love and compassion. That he would show his justice and he would show his mercy. In fact, his plan is not just to kind of compromise. He showed his perfect justice by punishing your sin on the cross. Right? He showed his perfect justice by letting all of your sin be punished on the cross. And he shows his perfect mercy by providing a substitute on that cross to take the punishment of your sin. God creates this universe basically he creates a problem that only he can solve satan thinks he's broken and won the whole thing but god comes through and shows his perfect justice and his perfect mercy right and some of us might go well now wait a minute wait a minute hold, hold, hold on um yeah it doesn't really work though because some of us receive that mercy and justice in Christ and a lot of us don't there's a lot of people who are going to miss out a lot of people who aren't going to be there so maybe this doesn't work really like God hoped it would work but guess what God's book that he unsealed reveals something even more in fact when they opened that book in Revelation 13 8 it says that all who dwell on the earth will worship the beast. It's talking about the beast. You know, at the end times, the beast of the Antichrist. All who dwell on the earth will be Satan worshipers, basically. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. In other words, God opens his book that he sealed before, let there be light, and your name is in it. My name is in it. If you are a Christ follower, it's because your name has been written in the book from before time began. Daniel tells us the same thing in the Old Testament. He says there will be a time of anguish greater than any since nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Come on, somebody ought to say praise the Lord about that. God's plan works. That's, is this the 830 service? It feels like the 830 service. I'm pretty excited about this. So how does that all work out then? Because it also says that I will be judged for everything I did. Yeah, here's the way it's going to work. Here's the way it's going to work. We'll all stand before the judgment seat of God and the ledger of your life will be opened this is a separate book this is your book it's a much smaller <laughs> book and he opens your book and if you are a believer 
he will go through and every single word, every single action, everything in your life either says, yes, God deserves to be God, or it says, no, I could be God. Everything you've done either agrees with God or agrees with the enemy. And if you are a Christ follower, every thing in your ledger that agrees with the enemy is ripped out and it is nailed with Jesus on the cross. Every, everything that you ever did that was wrong, every heart you ever broke, every lie you ever told, every time your life agreed with Satan, it's nailed to the cross. And the only thing left to look at is the things that you did that agree with God, that yes, he deserves to be God. He deserves to be trusted. He deserves to be acted upon. He is God alone. Nobody else in my life is worth being God, only him. That's all that remains. Here's my question for you. Here's my question for you. How much will be left of your book? How much will be left? Will the bulk of it agree with God, or will the bulk of it be destroyed with very little left the whole reason God created you is to make his case is to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt to all of the heavenly host that God alone deserves to be God right in Ephesians 1 uh, Paul tells us that even before he made the world even before he made the world God loved us chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing himself by sorry by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. He goes on in uh, verse 11. He says, furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance for God, uh, from God, because he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Come on, he makes everything work out according to his plan. Isn't it great that we serve a God who's already got it all written out? He's not just hoping it's going to happen right. He's not just kind of bobbing and weaving his way through eternity. He's got it all written out, and it will all work out according to his plan. For me and you, that means that all he sees is the parts of our lives that agree with him. And I don't know about you, but I want my book to be full of agreement with God. I don't want there to be any agreement with the accuser, with the liar, the one who's out to destroy God's reputation and to destroy you. I don't want to be that guy. I want a full book of agreeing with God. Can I get an amen? amen. But that's not the way it'll work for everybody. Because on that day, there will be people who never place their trust in the substitute of Jesus on the cross. And Revelation 20 says, if anyone's name was not found written in that big book of life, he's thrown into the lake of fire. Not everybody is going to make it. The question, my question for you is, have you placed your trust in the substitute that Jesus, of Jesus on the cross? You are not destined for flames. You are destined to live forever in heaven, agreeing that God alone is worthy of being God. When he opens the book of life, your name will be read and your record of wrong will be expunged because Jesus has already paid for it on the cross. And your works now, everything that you do now, when you're powered by the Spirit, you're agreeing with him and your book is being filled with a testimony that agrees that God alone is worthy of being God. In other words, next blank on your page, my life is designed to prove that God alone deserves to be God. Y you hear me? Your life is designed to prove that God alone deserves to be God. Does it? Does your life prove that God deserves to be God? 
Think about it this way. Judgment Day, when your works are looked at, your works will not vindicate or justify you. His work does that. Am I right? His work does that. And so when your book is read, your book vindicates him. Your, the, the body of work in your life will either vindicate Lucifer or it'll vindicate God. The work of your life says, I could be God or he alone is God. Where do you stand? with the decisions that you make when you're at work when you're at home when you're spending your money when you're talking to your kids where do you stand I promise you nobody nobody will ever enter heaven thinking that somehow their works vindicated them and now they deserve to be there everyone who ever steps foot into heaven the only people who ever step foot into heaven are those that know that my works justify and vindicate him, that my works contribute to his name being made great. That's what my works are for. My works glorify God, not me. So the question that ought to rock us, that ought to set us on fire, the question that ought to cause war to break out in our lives, in our bank accounts, in our time management, in, in the way that we talk to everybody and act around everybody and even alone, is this. Is God worth being God in your life? Does God deserve to be God in your life? When you feel betrayed by someone, someone's done you wrong, how do you respond? <laughs> Does God deserve to be God in that situation? Or should you be God? When you've made a commitment that you don't feel like keeping, does God deserve to be God? Or should you be God? When you feel lost and alone, does God deserve to be God or you? That's the question that ought to set us on fire. That's the question that ought to make us reevaluate everything in our lives. Because our lives were designed to scream out that God alone is worthy of being God. That's why at the triumphal entry, when Jesus is riding that donkey into Jerusalem, the Pharisees are getting mad because Jesus is getting glory. And so they get to the disciples. They're like, shut up, shut up, stop this. And they even tell Jesus, tell your disciples to stop this. And Jesus looks to them in Luke 19, and he says, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Does your life cheer God? Does it scream God? Or does it stand with the accuser? Last blank is the question for us all today. Does God deserve to be God in my life? 